A very warm welcome and thank you very much to our friends at the United Nations for the opportunity to address this workshop and provide a background and overview of the compendium of recommended practices, context, objectives and methodology. For the past 20 years, the Biometrics Institute has been promoting the responsible and ethical use of biometrics. We represent a multi-stakeholder community in an independent global forum, including government departments, organizations using the technology, like financial services or in aviation, as well as the technology suppliers, the academics researching the area, privacy experts, regulators, and international organizations like the United Nations. We have brought together hundreds of years of experience in this independent, not-for-profit membership organization, providing tools that help organizations with their biometric projects. As early as 2003, we put privacy on top of the agenda for any biometric implementation. And already in 2008, we initiated debate about vulnerabilities in the technology. Today, we have the Biometrics Institute Privacy Guidelines, the three laws of biometrics, and a good practice framework, amongst many other tools that we provide. And then in 2018, we worked with the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directorate and the Office for Counterterrorism in writing this compendium. And the pen holder for this compendium from the Biometrics Institute was Roger Baldwin, who is on our advisory council. And Roger is going to provide you now with an overview of this compendium. So, Roger, welcome and over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Isabel. And hello, everyone. Uh, in this session, I'd like to run through the main issues that are contained within the compendium. And I think the first important point to stress is that a biometric system is a powerful tool in identifying people. And as such, it needs to be used correctly and not misused or used illegally in any sense. And in order to do that, there needs to be a balance. So counterterrorism capability from a biometrics perspective is looking at systems, sharing data across a country in national systems and potentially sharing data internationally. And in order to balance those requirements, effective oversight is essential. And at an international level, there are international laws and human rights laws that govern all uh, member states of the United Nations. And as well as that, there's the overall governance, legal structure and regulatory structures on a national level within your own countries. Biometric applications vary enormously. Uh, you can have a, a biometric on your phone in order to access the phone. You can have large collections of data that are processed as biometrics. Uh, and I will go through some examples with you now. But within a, the context of counterterrorism, 
the main biometric modalities are fingerprints, facial recognition, and DNA, amongst others. And there are two methods of processing biometrics. The first one is known as verification or one-to-one -one matching. And an example of this would be as you go through an electronic passport or travel document kiosk at an airport. And on your passport, you will have a biometric within the chipped machine readable zone. And for example, it may be a recorded image of your face. You will then place that onto the plate at the kiosk and the software will extract that image. And then you will look into a camera under controlled lighting conditions and a photograph of your face will be taken. And the software and the algorithm then determines whether your face matches the face on the passport. If it does, you're free to, to move through the kiosk to the other side. If the software determines that it isn't a match, then obviously you're referred to uh, a human for adjudication uh, and processing separately. The second form of biometric uh, modes is identification or one-to-many. This means that you've got a, a database of biometric material. And an example of this might be in a law enforcement context where you have criminal records linked to fingerprints. So if somebody is arrested and gives a false name or false particulars of their address, date of birth, etc., if they are already on the system, then their fingerprints will match. If the system is searched and the fingerprints do not match, then it's an indication that that person does not have a previous criminal record. So there are these two systems. One is, is very, very compact and dealing with authenticating a person's identity in a one-to-one -one situation. The other form is using a database. And obviously, some of these databases are very large. The Aadhaar system in India is extremely large. It's population-based. There are some smaller databases called watch lists, and we'll be looking at these shortly, uh, that may only have a few or several hundred uh, entries on it. The other main factor around biometric systems is system performance. And there are two elements here that it's important to differentiate. The first is failing to identify. And so in the examples we just looked at with passports and with criminal records, the system may not find or may not identify the person even if they are on the system. Uh, and in the case of a passport, the image contained in the passport or the, the actual image captured by the camera may sometimes not be of sufficient quality for the system to make a match. And similarly, in a database context, uh, the, the software may fail to identify somebody because of poor quality data. The other type of error would be misidentifying. In other words, I put my fingerprints into the system and the matching software maintains that my fingerprints are somebody else's fingerprints. This is very rare in high quality samples, the ones we've talked about here where 
we have controlled conditions. But when we start to consider forensic science applications where material from crime scenes is recovered, that's a variable quality. And this is where we need extra safeguards to ensure that the matching is done correctly. And I'll talk a little more about that later on. So now I'd like to have a look specifically at the forensic science biometrics that we use in counterterrorism systems. And there are several factors here that provide excellent guidance for people using uh, biometric systems. And the first one is to prove or disprove somebody's involvement in terrorism. And I think this is an extremely important point to remember that the fact that we're dealing here with biometrics and identity, that the evidence may or may not implicate somebody in terrorism. It may, in fact, exonerate them. And this is an extremely important point, as I say. Using this objective and reliable process reduces reliance on issues such as confessions contained within criminal investigations or the use of torture or other coercive measures which become unnecessary. The biometric material recovered from crime scenes allows us to interpret activity at the scenes. It also allows us to link a person to activities to events, to locations, and importantly, this can be done before or during or after an incident. So it can be at the planning stage, we may want to identify people who are involved, it may be during the commission of a crime, it may be after a crime. And of course, Biometric material from crime scenes also helps us to link one event to another event across a single investigation or multiple incidents. And of course, because we're dealing with material that can be identified, it may be or may not be necessary to identify the person. It may not be possible. They may not be on the database, but we may be able, for example, to recover the same fingerprint from the same finger at two different incident scenes and be able to link them even though we haven't identified that fingerprint yet. And lastly, we are in the 21st century. Biometrics uh, are increasingly being used on electronic and digital systems in the finance sector and retail. So obviously there are biometrics uh, across these systems as well as in the physical world. I'd just like to talk a little bit more about governance and regulation that we looked at in that first slide. It's an obligation of all member states, as I said before, uh, to comply with international and human rights law in regard to counterterrorism activities. In some countries, there's a need for ethical review, and this is considered good practice internationally. Uh, and some countries will have separate review bodies to look at the ethics involved in their biometric systems. And the members of these review bodies are normally drawn from across civil society. So they're nothing to do with law enforcement or government personnel, but they're people drawn from society who will reflect on the ethics of using biometrics within the particular system being operated in that country. 
data protection and the right to privacy, uh, as Isabel mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the Biometrics Institute has guidelines for implementing uh, data protection and privacy into any biometric system. Uh, there are other examples there. The European Union has its general data protection regulations which enforce privacy and data protection for all EU citizens. So it's a very important element wherever counter-terrorism biometric systems are implemented. Vulnerabilities and system risk refers to presentation attacks. So this may be a cyber attack on a system to, to gain data. It may be uh, somebody presenting, for example, a uh, high quality face mask to, to fool a facial recognition system or placing uh, a false fingerprint, uh, perhaps on a silicon mold over their fingers to fool a fingerprint system. Uh, this is a continual issue with all biometric systems. Uh, there are mitigating measures that the systems have for preventing uh, presentation attacks. And whichever system is used has to be kept up to date and protected against such attacks. Many countries that use counter-terrorism systems are used using international standards. And this may be from the standards organization, the International Standards Organization or the International Electro-Technical Commission. And this relates not only to the biometric systems, the performance, the matching, but there are international standards relating to the processing of forensic science material. The material collected from crime scenes and the matching of that material and the processing. So international standards are used extensively by countries operating these biometric systems. And the final thing to look at is the procurement of the system and the resource management. One of the problems with a, a biometric system where you're going to be processing very important data is to make sure that the system can maintain its capacity to deal with large inputs if that's required and also to upgrade performance as the system gets older. So investment in any biometric system has to be continual throughout its life cycle. It's not just a question of purchasing a system. You have to make sure that it's upgraded. It can deal with capacity. And as we mentioned before, it maintains presentation attack detection throughout its life cycle. So earlier I was talking about databases and I mentioned watch lists, perhaps smaller databases, although a watch list doesn't necessarily mean that it's small in size, but it can be just a few records up to millions. So. I'd now like to consider what a biometric watch list would look like for a country. And of course, the biometrics are collected at borders. Uh, we've already talked about those on travel documents, but in some countries, biometrics are collected on entry and sometimes on exit from the country, 
particularly for foreign nationals. So it may be fingerprints and or face. And these are used in a counter-terrorism context to protect the country. And I'll talk a little more about that later. But then, of course, you also have your police applications, the criminal records, things like fingerprints, DNA profiles, uh, face images, and crime scene material that we've been looking at as well. So there you have two large collections of biometric material that could be accessed if it's legal to do so within your country. There are other national applications, perhaps, for example, uh, face images on driving licenses uh, that could be accessed again if it's legal within your country. And also, in some countries, the military is used in counterterrorism or insurgency operations within its own borders or, or overseas. And there may be biometric material recovered during those military operations against insurgents or terrorists that could also be used in a watch list if it's legal to do so. And then, of course, we have the international uh, collection. It may be sharing data with neighboring countries. It may be within a region. Or there may be a requirement to share data on a global basis. And this is where the Interpol databases, DNA, fingerprints and face, would come into play. Uh, because all of the countries that are operating under Interpol, the ICPO, have the facility to upload such data for search and comparison. I'd like to highlight four very key concepts that are contained within the compendium. And the first one, data sharing, which we've talked about. This provides protection not only for your country, but if you share internationally, it will protect other countries. And the reverse is true, that if another country shares its data with you, it may be your country that's protected by that data. And this data, usually, uh, depending on your retention laws, will sit in the system for years, potentially, and provide lawful surveillance 24 hours a day, every day of the year. So the system takes no days off. It doesn't sleep. It is checking all of the time uh, to protect your borders, to protect your citizens within your country. And if you're sharing it internationally with other countries. The third concept is an extremely important issue, and that is contextual assessment of any matches that your biometric system produces. Just because somebody has been identified, whether it's through DNA, face recognition or fingerprints on a counter-terrorism system, doesn't necessarily mean that they are a terrorist. And any match needs to be thoroughly reviewed before any action is taken. Because there will be collateral identifications made, i.e. people who have legitimate access to objects that are involved in investigations and their fingerprints, their DNA may be disclosed and matched, perhaps as they're passing through a border. But they're not terrorists 
And I think this is a very, very important point to make that before any action is taken, a full contextual assessment needs to be made by investigators. The fourth concept is around the proactive and predictive capability of counterterrorism biometrics. And I'll explain this in a little more detail. In a traditional law enforcement context, any database, whether it's fingerprints, DNA, face, voice, whatever is being used in the modality, first of all, ask, who are you? Do, do we know you? What's your criminal history? As we said earlier, we, we looked at looking at the criminal history, to see if somebody has uh, a criminal record or whether they have certain visa status within borders. Then in a wider sense, who are your associates? So if we know who you are, who might you be associating with? What have you done? So this could be a result of perhaps a, a DNA profile match to a crime scene. And as we looked at earlier, the linking of crime scenes where we might find similar biometrics at a number of crime scenes and know that there's a series of them being committed. So what do I mean by proactive and predictive biometrics? If we combine these databases, for example, our borders database, our policing database, sharing data with international partners, it may be we identify somebody who has previous convictions for terrorism or is suspected of terrorism in other places. And that raises questions such as what are they planning to do? Where are they planning to do it and when? And are they acting alone or as part of a group? Obviously, this is fairly general in a sense, but it moves beyond the traditional database questions in law enforcement. And it's very important that we anticipate where there may be a terrorist attack in order to prevent it, not just do the investigation after it's occurred. So this is what we mean by a proactive approach using biometrics. We want to stop potential terrorists from committing mass murder uh, anywhere, whether that's in our country or our neighboring countries or the countries we share our data with. The principle I've talked about with data sharing, uh, if you look at these radio telescopes, each telescope will accurately track a certain section of the sky. When you have an array of these telescopes, you can track a very large part of the sky at one time. And the same holds true with biometric databases in counterterrorism applications. The more data that you can legally link and search, the wider your view and the greater protection you provide for your citizens. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any further queries, please contact the Institute.
and the details are shown there on the last slide. Thank you and goodbye.